Hello, I apologize profusely for that very <clears throat> rude interruption. Let's go back and reread what we last read. But oh my, what a long step it is from the blunt statement 7 plus, 10, 7 plus 3 equals 10 to our cautious generalization hedged with definitions and conditions. We have, in a certain sense, pulled the whole of arithmetic over the line that was to divide Crutura from Pleroma. That is, the statement no longer has the flavor of naked truth, Pleroma is naked truth, I guess, sort of, a little bit, but like, even even to call it naked truth would be to represent it, right? It's it's so naked that it can't be represented. Um, the statement no longer has the flavor of naked truth and instead is clearly an artifact of human thought. Indeed, the thought of particular humans at particular times and places. So there's something about 7 plus 3 equals 10 that's more naked because it's less theoretical, it's a particular instance, right? And so you can point to it so it feels more raw, more objective, more pure. Whereas when we do the algebra, x plus y equals z, we're talking about a class of relationships now. And so we're clearly in this realm of relationships instead of particular things. Is it then so that St. Augustine's eternal verities are only spin-offs from particular ideas or customs cherished at various times by various human cultural systems? I am an anthropologist by trade and training, says Gregory Bateson, and ideas of cultural relativity are part of the anthropological orthodoxy. But how far can cultural relativity go? What can the cultural relativists say about the eternal verities? Does not arithmetic have roots in the unchanging, solid rock of Pleroma? And how can we talk about such a question? Is there, then, such a subject of inquiry as epistemology with a capital E? Or is it all a matter of local and even personal epistemologies, any one of which is any good as any other? Right, as it, <clears throat> or, so is there, then, such a subject of inquiry as epistemology with a capital E? Or is it all a matter of local and even personal epistemologies of which any one is as good as right as any other, right? So is there like, is there some sort of truth to knowing? Are there general properties of knowledge, of knowing, of perceiving the pleroma that are going to transcend cultural differences? Or is all epistemologies lowercase e? I don't know. These are the kinds of questions that arise when we try to survey the interface between Pleroma and Quitura, and it is clear that arithmetic somehow lies very close to that line. These are the kinds of questions that arise when we try to examine the interface between Pleroma and Quitura, and it is clear that arithmetic somehow lies very close to that line. But do not dismiss such questions as abstract or intellectual and therefore meaningless for these abstract questions will lead us to some very immediately human matters. What sort of question are we asking when we say, what is heresy, heresy? Or what is a sacrament? These are deeply human questions, matters of life and death, sanity and insanity to millions of people. And the answers, if any, are concealed in the paradoxes generated by the line between Critura and Pleroma, the line with the Gnostics, Young and I would substitute for the Cartesian separation of mind from matter the line that is really a bridge or a pathway for messages. Is it possible to be epistemologically wrong? Wrong at the very root of thought? Christians, Muslims, Marxists, and many biologists say, yes, there is such an error, heresy, and equate it with spiritual death. The other religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, the more frankly pluralistic religions, seem to be largely unaware of the problem. The possibility of epistemological error does not enter their epistemology. This is epistemological error with a capital E. And today, in America, it is almost heresy to believe that the roots of thought have any importance, and it is undemocratic to excommunicate a man for epistemological errors. If religions are concerned with epistemology, how shall we interpret the fact that some have a concept of heresy and others do not? If religions are concerned with epistemology with a capital E, 
how shall we interpret the fact that some have the concept of heresy and some do not? I'm not sure that that's true. I think that maybe all religions have a concept of heresy, even the pluralistic ones. But um, we can believe him for a moment, see what he says. I believe that the story goes back to the most sophisticated religion that the world has known, that of the Pythagoreans. He's certainly wrong there. What do you mean the most sophisticated religion was that of the Pythagoreans? I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, I believe that the story goes back to the most sophisticated religion that the world has ever known, that of the Pythagoreans. Like St. Augustine, they knew that truth with a capital T has some of its roots, not all, in numerology, in numbers. The history is obscure, probably because it is difficult for us to see the world through Pythagorean eyes, but it seems to be something like this. Egyptian mathematics was pure arithmetic and always particular, never making the jump from 7 and 3 are 10 to x plus y equals z. Their mathematics contained no deductions and no proofs as we would understand them. The Greeks had proofs from about the 5th century BC, but it seemed that mere deduction is a toy until the, until the discovery of a proof of impossibility by reductio ad absurdum. The Pythagoreans had a whole string of theorems, which are not taught in school today, about the relations between even and odd numbers. The climax of this study was the proof that the isosceles right triangle with sides of unit length is insoluble, that the square root of 2 cannot be an either even or an odd number, and therefore cannot be a number, and therefore cannot be a number, or be expressed as a ratio between two numbers. This discovery hit the Pythagoreans squarely between the eyes and became a central secret, but why a secret in an, an esoteric tenet of their faith? Their religion had been founded on the discontinuity of a series of musical harmonics. The demonstration that the discontinuity was indeed real was firmly founded upon rigorous deduction. And now they faced an impossibility proof. Deduction had been said, deduction had said no. As I read the story, from then on it was inevitable to believe, to see, and to know that a contradiction among higher generalizations will always lead to mental chaos. From this point on, the idea of heresy, the notion that to be wrong in epistemology could be lethal, was inevitable. All this sweat and tears and even blood was to be shed on quite abstract propositions whose truth, capital T, truth, seemed to lie, in some sense, outside the human mind. The square root of 2 is real. It doesn't matter if we think about it or not, it's real. Outside of the mind. As I see it, the propositions that Augustine and Pythagoras were interested in, and which Augustine called eternal verities, are in a sense latent in the pleroma, only waiting to be labeled by some scientist. The regularities are latent in the pleroma. If, for example, a man is pouring lentils or grains of sand from one container or another, he is not aware of any numbering of the units, but still within the crowd of lentils or grains it is true, or would be true if somebody got in there and did some counting. Perhaps the ghost of Bishop Berkeley might be willing to do it for us, just to make sure that the truth is still the same as if we were not there. It is true that 7 plus 3 equals 10 among the lentils. In this sense, there's a whole slew of regularities out there in the pleroma, unnamed, ready to be picked up. But the distinctions and differences that would be used in analysis have not been drawn, and in the absence of organisms to whom the difference can make a difference, Bishop Berkeley always forgot the grass and the squirrels in the woods for whom the falling of a tree made a meaningful sound. Um, I'm going to read that again. In this sense, there is a whole slew of regularities out there in the pleroma, unnamed, ready to be picked up. But the distinctions and differences that would be used in an analysis have not be drawn, have not been drawn in the absence of organisms to whom the difference can make a difference. Bishop Berkeley always forgot the grass and the squirrels in the woods for whom the falling tree made a meaningful sound. I guess it was Bishop Berkeley who asked if a tree falls in the forest if it makes a sound. I want to be very clear that the contrast between pleromatic regularities and those regularities that exist inside mental or and organized systems, 
Mm. I want to make very clear the contrast between pleuromatic regularities and those regularities that exist inside mental and organized systems. So the ple pleuromatic regularities would be like, you know, Bohr's model of the atom, whereas the creatural regularities would be the the form that makes up my genome. Um, the information that makes up my genome. There's information in my genome, there's no information in the atom. Both have regularities. I want to make clear that the contrast between pleuromatic regularities and those regularities that exist inside mental and organized systems, the necessary limitations and patterns of mental process, such as I want to make very clear the contrast between pleuromatic regularities and those regularities that exist inside mental and organized systems, those necessary limitations and patterns of mental process, such as those of coding and logical typing. McCulloch's famous double question, what is a number that a man may know it, and what is a man that he may know a number, takes on a very different coloring, presents new difficulties when we substitute some archetype for the utterly impersonal concept number. The Jungian archetypes have a certain claim to transcend the purely local, but they belong squarely within the realm of a creatura. For example, what is a father that a man, a woman, a child may know him? And what is a man, a woman, or child that he or she may know a father? Let me offer you an example. What in the field of anthropology we would call a native text, a crucial, a crucial cultural utterance. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The epistemology latent in the text is enough to keep us busy for a long while. The words themselves are sanctified, hallowed, to use the idiom, by the gospel narrative of Matt 6-9, according to which Jesus recommended this prayer to his disciples for myriad repetition. In every Christian ceremony, these words are in a strange way the rock upon which the whole structure stands. The words are the familiar theme to which the ritual continually returns, not as a logical premise, but rather as music returns to a theme or phrase from which it is built. For while the quasi-pleuromic verities of Augustine and Pythagoras have roots in logic or mathematics, we are now looking at something different. Our father. Dot, dot, dot. This is the language of metaphor, and a very strange language it is. First, we need some contrasting data to show that we are in the realm of epistemology with a small e. If you would look for an absolute epistemology among the metaphors, you must go one or perhaps two stories higher, straight on and up the stairs. In Bali, when a shaman or a Balian goes into the state of altered consciousness, he or she speaks with the voice of God, using pronouns appropriate to God, and so on. When this voice addresses ordinary adult mortals, it will call them Papa or Mama, for the Balinese think the relationship between gods and people as between children and parents, and in this relationship it is the gods who are the children, and the people who are the parents. The Balinese do not expect their gods to be responsible. They do not feel cheated when their gods are capricious. Indeed, they enjoy a minor caprice and charm, as these are exhibited by gods temporarily incarnate in shamans. How unlike our dear Job. This particular metaphor, then, between fatherhood and godhead, is by no means eternal or universal. In other words, the logic of metaphor is something very different from the logic of the verities of Augustine and Pythagoras. Not, you understand, wrong, incorrect, but totally different. It may be, however, that while particular metaphors are local, the process of making a metaphor has some wider significance, may indeed be a basic characteristic of Creatura. Let me point out the contrast between tr the truths of metaphor and the truths that mathematicians pursue by rather violent and inappropriate. Let me point out the, p the contrast between the truths of metaphor and the truths that mathematicians pursue by a rather violent and inappropriate trick. Let me spell out metaphor in syllogistic form. Classical logic named several varieties of syllogism of which the best known is the syllogism in Barbara. I guess it was developed in Barbara, Greece. The syllogism in Barbara goes like this. Men die. All men die. Socrates is a man. Socrates will die, therefore. 
The basic structure of this little monster, its skeleton, is built upon classification. The predicate will die is attached to Socrates by identifying him as a member of a class whose members share that predicate. All men die. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates will die. There's a bat in my room flying around. Hi. <laughs> uh, I don't want to stop recording. I'm just going to let this bat fly around. You can't see it. It's, it's here, though. Okay. The syllogisms of metaphor are quite different and go like this. Grass dies. Men die. Men are grass. In order to talk about this kind of syllogism and compare it to the syllogism in Barbara, we can nickname it the syllogism in grass. I understand that teachers of classical logic strongly disapprove of this way of arguing and call it affirming the consequent, and of course, this pedantic condemnation is justified if what they condemn is confusion between one type of syllogism and the other, but to try to fight all syllogisms in grass would be silly because these syllogisms are the very stuff of which natural history is made. When we look for regularities in the biological world, we meet them all the time. Von Damaris long ago pointed out that schizophrenics commonly talk and act in terms of syllogisms in grass, and I think he too disapproved of the way of organizing of this way of organizing knowledge and life. If I remember rightly, he does not notice that poetry, art, dream, humor, and religion scare with schizophrenia a preference for syllogism in grass. Let's say that one more time. Poetry, art, dream, humor, and religion scare with schizophrenia a preference for syllogism in grass. We're not talking about deduction here. All men die, and Socrates was a man, therefore Socrates will die. We're just making analogies. Grass dies. Men die. Men are grass. But whether you disapprove of poetry, dream, and psychosis, the generalization remains that the biological data, that biological data makes sense, are connected together by syllogisms in grass. The whole of animal behavior, the whole of repetitive anatomy, the whole of biological evolution, each of these vast realms is within itself linked together by syllogisms in grass, whether logicians like it or not. All of the vertebra are vertebra, because they bear similarities to one another. They're not logical consequence of each other. They just have, an, have this, this core similarity to them, which makes them all vertebra. It's really very simple. In order to make syllogisms in Barbara, you, you must have identified classes so that subjects and predicates can be differentiated. But apart from language, there are no named classes and no subject-predicate relations in the Pleroma. Therefore, syllogisms in grass must be the dominant mode of communicating, inter of communicating interconnection of ideas in all pre-verbal realms. I think the first person who actually saw this clearly was Goethe, who noted that if you examine a cabbage and an oak tree, two rather different sorts of organism, both, but both still flowering plants, you will find that the way to talk about how they are put together is different from the way most people naturally talk. You see, we talk as if the creatura were really pleromatic. We talk about things, notably leaves or stems, and we try to determine what is what. Now, Goethe discovered that a leaf is defined as that which grows on a stem and has a bud at, in its angle. And what then comes out of that angle, out of that bud, is again a stem. The correct units of description are not leaf and stem, but relations between them. The correct units of description are not the things, not the leaf and stem, but the relations between them. These correspondences allow you to look at another flowering plant, a potato for instance, and recognize the part that you eat in fact corresponds to a stem. In the same way, most of us were taught in school that a noun is the name of a person, place, or thing. But what we should have been taught is that a noun can stand in, in, sorry, in the same way, most of us were taught in school that a noun is a person, is the name of a person, place, or thing. But what we should have been taught is that a noun can stand in various kinds of relationship to other parts of the sentence, so that the whole of grammar could be defined as a relationship and not in terms of things. This naming activity, which probably other organisms don't indulge in, is in fact a sort of pleromatizing of the living world. 
and obs and obs and obscure that grammatical relationship. Uh, sorry, <laughs> this naming activity, which probably other organisms don't indulge in, is in fact a sort of pleromatizing, pleromatizing of the living world. It's interesting. We so the living world has is all about relationship, and when we name things, we try to give it a a kind of concreteness which it does not have. And observe that grammatical relationships are of the pre-verbal kinds. And observe that the grammatic and observe that grammatical relationships are of the pre-verbal kind. The, sti the ship struck a reef and I spanked my daughter are tied together by grammatical analogy. Hmm. I went to see a nice little wolf pack in Chicago at the Brookfield Zoo. Ten of them lying asleep all day and the eleventh one, the dominant male, busily running around keeping track of things. Now what wolves do is to go out hunting, and then they come home and regurgitate their food to share with the puppies who aren't al who weren't along on the hunt. And the puppies can signal the adults to regurgitate. But eventually, the adult wolves wean the babies from their regurgitated food by pressing down their jaws on the backs of the baby's necks. In the domestic dog, females eventually wean their young from milk in the same way. In Chicago, they told me that the previous year, one of the junior males had succeeded in mounting a female. Up rushed the lead male, the alpha animal, but instead of mayhem, all that happened was that the leader pressed the head of the junior down to the ground in the same way, once, twice, four times, and then walked off. The communication that occurred was metaphoric. You puppy, you. The communication to the junior wolf of how to behave is based on a syllogism in grass. But let us go back to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Of course, my assertion that all pre-verbal and non-verbal communication depends on metaphor and or syllogism in grass does not mean that all verbal communication is or should be logical or non-metaphoric. Metaphor runs right through Kritura, so of course all verbal communication necessarily contains metaphor. And metaphor, when it is dressed in words, has added to and, and metaphor, when it is dressed in words, has added to it those characteristics that verbalism can achieve. The possibility of simple negation, that there is no, there is no not at the pre-verbal level. The possibility of classification, of subject predicate differentiation, and the possibility of explicit context marking. Finally, there is the possibility with words of jumping right out of the metaphoric and poetic and in, into simile. When Weihinger calls the as-if mode of communication becomes something else when the as-if is added. In other words, it becomes prose. And then all the limitations of the syllogisms that, logic, that logicians prefer, Barbara and the rest, must be precisely obeyed. We're going to talk about as-if. I didn't read that paragraph properly because I was itchy, so I'm going to read it again. Finally, there is the possibility with words of jumping right out of the metaphoric and poetic mode and into simile. What Wagner called the as-if mode of communication becomes something else when the as-if is added. In a word, it becomes prose, and then all the limitations of the syllogisms that, log that logicians prefer, Barbara and the rest, must be precisely obeyed. The Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, might become it is as if you or something were alive and personal, and if that were so, it would perhaps be appropriate to talk to you in words. So, although, of course, you are not a relative of mine, since you only as if exist and are, as it were, in another plane, heaven, etc., you are as if my father, etc., etc. And you know, in human ethnography, the creativeness of human minds is capable of that extreme, and most surprisingly, that extreme can itself constitute a religion among behaviorists, for example. In a currently fashionable metaphor, the right hemisphere can applaud and be reassured in the prosy, cautious logic of the left. The very act of translation, from grass to Barbara, from metaphor to simile, and from poetry to prose, can itself become sacramental a sacred metaphor for a particular religious stance. Cromwell's troops could run around England, breaking the noses and even heads and genitals off the statues in the churches in a religious fervor, simultaneously stressing their own total misunderstanding of what the metaphoric sacred is all about. I used to say, have said many times, 
that the Protestant interpretation of the words, this is my body, this is my blood, substitutes something like, this stands for my body, this stands for my blood. This way of interpretation banished from the church that part of the mind that makes metaphor, poetry, and religion that part of the mind that most belonged in the church, but you cannot keep it out. There is no doubt that Cromwell's troops were making their own horrible poetry by their acts of vandalism, in which indeed they smashed the metaphoric genitals as if they were real, in the left brain sense. <laughs> what a mess. But nonetheless, we cannot simply discard the logic of metaphor and syllogism in grass, for the syllogism in Barbara would be of little use in the biological world until the invention of language and the separation of subjects from predicates. In other words, it looks as though until about 10,000 years ago, perhaps at most 1 million years ago, there were no Barbara syllogisms in the world, and there were only Bateson's kind, and still the organisms got along all right. They managed to organize themselves in their embryology to have two eyes, one on each side of a nose. They managed to organize themselves in their evolution so that there were shared predicates between the horse and the man, which the zoologists today call homology. It becomes evident that metaphor is not just pretty poetry, is not either good or bad logic, but is in fact the logic upon which the biological world has been built. The main characteristic of organizing glue of this world is the mental process that I've been trying to sketch for you. Well then, that's what Gregory Bateson has to say about the Pleroma. Do I have anything to say about the Pleroma? Oh gosh, maybe. Another time. Another video. I'll see you later. I gotta go catch a bat.